Karma jayo ya karma na ha. Sharira yatra pichate. Na proceed yet a karma na ha. Niya tang kuru karma twang. Karma jayo ya karma na ha. Sharira yatra pichate. Na proceed yet a karma na ha. Sharira yatra pichate. Na proceed yet a karma na ha. Niya tang kuru karma twang. Karma jaya ya karma na ha. Sharira yatra pichate. Na proceed yet a karma na ha. Shri-ra-yatra-pichate-na-pasidhyad-karmanah <laughs> Niya tang kuru karma twang Karma jaya ya karma na ha Sharira yatra pichate Na prasid yad karma na ha Niya tang Prescribed Kuru do. Do. Karma. Um. Duties. Duties. Tram. You. you. Karma. Karma. Work. Work. Jayaha. Jayaha. Better. Better. He. he. Certainly. Certainly. A karma naha. Than, no Than no work. Sharira. Sharira. Bodily. Bodily. Yatra. Yatra. <laughs> Maintenance. Api. Even. Even. Cha. Also, te, your, na, never, prasid yet, is effected, akarmanaha, without work. Translation and purport by Srila Prabhupada. Perform your prescribed duty, for doing so is better than not working. One cannot even maintain one's physical body without work. Are we okay, Maharaj? Pardon? No? Well, it might be. I probably haven't turned it on. I don't fiddle around with these things. That's probably what it was. Yeah, it's not on. Hey, Maharaj. You're, I know you were down for class. These cartels, I say, you know, they're not fit, you know, for even, you know, dying, huh? No, you show Maharaj those cartels. Give him the cartels. They're awful. They're, they sound like clunk, like clunk, clunk, clunk. The devotee came in and said that every time he brings them in, somebody pinches them. But they're really a bad sound. For the next speaker. But it's nice if someone locks them up so they don't go missing for the next night. Purport. There are many pseudo-meditators who misrepresent themselves as belonging to high parentage and great professional men 
who falsely pose that they have sacrificed everything for the sake of advancement in spiritual life. Lord Krishna did not want Arjuna to become a pretender. Rather, the Lord desired that Arjuna perform his prescribed duties as set forth for Kshatriyas. Arjuna was a householder and a military man, excuse me, a military general, and therefore it was better for him to remain as such and perform his religious duties as prescribed for the householder Kshatriya. Such activities gradually cleanse the heart of a mundane man and free him from material contamination. So-called renunciation for the purpose of maintenance is never approved by the Lord nor by any religious scripture. After all, one has to maintain one's body and soul together by some work. Work should not be given up capriciously without purification of materialistic propensities. Anyone who is in the material world is certainly possessed of the impure propensity for lording it over material nature. Or, in other words, for a sense gratification. Such polluted propensities have to be cleared. Without doing so, through prescribed duties, one should never attempt to become a so-called transcendentalist, renouncing work and living at the cost of others. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. I'll read the verse again since some of those devotees who may be listening online may not have heard the verse. Niyatam kuru karma tvam karma jayo ya karmanaha sharira yatra pi chate na prastidhyad karmanaha Perform your prescribed duties. For doing so is better than not working. One cannot even maintain one's physical body without work. Well, this is a very important section of the Bhagavad Gita. Um, for devotees in general and certainly for people in general. We see in the second chapter that after Arjuna has presented very structurally, you can say very soberly and very intelligently from the material perspective, various arguments, various statements whereby he was justifying his desire not to fight. He wasn't just running away out of cowardice. That wasn't his ideal, though Arjuna mentioned that people would think like that. Um, but he had so many reasons why he conjectured that to fight in this battle of Kurukshetra was not a good idea. Better I go away and not be a part of this. But if, as we know, uh, Krishna didn't exactly agree with him. Ashochananda Samchastva, Pragyavadams Chabasa Se Katasam Akatasam Cha Nanu Sochanti Panditaha. Krishna said to Arjuna, Oh Arjuna, you are speaking like a learned man, but actually you are speaking a load of nonsense. Yeah, you are speaking like a fool who laments over what is not worthy of grief. Because you've missed the whole purpose. You've missed the whole purpose of life. You've missed the goal, the goal of everything. We tend to separate. See, Maya is very clever. We sometimes distinguish different aspects of Maya as being Maya or not Maya. But seeing anything separate from Krishna is called Maya. To see the material world separate from Krishna is Maya. Everything is connected to Krishna. Everything is nothing but another expansion of Krishna. You could say it's his chincha shakti expanding in different ways, but there's no different to his very self. 
the material energy is just, you could say, a reflection of his very self. It's an expansion of Krishna. We call it the universal Virat Rup. But nonetheless, it's connected to Krishna. We're all connected to Krishna. Everything has its part. And it's learning how to connect everything, not to reject. Rupa Go, one of Rupa Goswami's primary instructions, isn't it? Nirbanda Krishna Sambande, Yukta Varagya Uchate, isn't it? That we shouldn't reject anything because everything belongs to Krishna. What we have now, for instance, our present condition, this material body, this material mind, yeah, sure, we can say we've received it from karmic reactions. It's material, we call it material. It's, it's a you know, combination of the various energies of Krishna, influenced by time, and, you know, constructed by, you know, by the material energy, of, according to the individual's karma, we have our different residences and so on. But it's still, it's, nonetheless, it's Krishna's energy. And we've received it from Krishna. And it's not to be rejected. Arjuna was thinking of rejecting it and do what he felt would be feel good the mood of the day do what feels good, right? isn't it? oh, I like that that feels good but that's not necessarily Krishna conscious although it's the nature of the soul wants to feel good wants to be happy but that is not to be found separate from Krishna we can only be satisfied because our nature is to be connected to Krishna, we're Krishna's parts and parcels. Mame Vangsa Jiva Loke, Jiva Bhuta Sanatanaha. We have to connect with Krishna. So if we see the material energy as separate from Krishna, we're missing the point. We have to know how to connect that with Krishna. And he's given us this body and mind. Simply not that we have to imitate somebody else or think, oh, it will be better if only I had that position, that body, that situation. Krishna has given us what we've got. And he's given us the instruction how to act accordingly to what situation we're in. If we're in a male body, he's given instructions. If we're in a female body, he's given instructions. If we have a, a Brahmin, or let's say the nature of someone who's more Brahminical, he's given instructions. Everything's found in Shastra. Bhagavad Gita gives a synopsis of this point performing one's duty, prescribed duty. There are two types of svadharma or prescribed duties, niyamas. One of them is according to your nature or our nature. One of them is according to spiritual condition, or spiritual, constitutional, or instruction coming from the spiritual platform, the spiritual master, etc. But they should, all, they should generally be compatible with each other. Sometimes there's a conflict, no doubt, but generally compatible. So looking at this one, here we're looking at primarily, you can say, the condition according to one's material, uh, what situation one is in materially, which is where we have to start. Most people are not very transcendental. Most devotees are not necessarily on the transcendental platform. I don't know if you've noticed, but it's not always the case, right? You see what people are looking in their faces. What do you think, Ananta? Are we always transcendental to the modes? Yes. <laughs> hey. <laughs> Not always. <laughs> Sometimes we remember a little bit about our relationship with Krishna. Sometimes we're affected by what we perceive is going on in this world. And that's only according to how we perceive it too. Anyway, it's a big topic. But the point being that Krishna here in this chapter particularly is getting to the heart of it. In the second chapter we mentioned Krishna didn't appreciate Arjuna's arguments exactly. And materially I'm sure that most materialistic people um, would have a lot of respect and appreciation for Arjuna's statements. No war, peace, you know, this, that, the other. You know, protection of the society and so on. Good ar arguments materially. But Krishna immediately dived in and immediately struck right in the core and he said, Arjuna, don't you understand you're not this body? He went right to the point. He didn't beat around the bush. He went right in there. And Prabhupada says, uh, Krishna immediately called Arjuna a damn fool, number one. Prabhupada's very words. 
You're just a damn fool, aren't you? <laughs> that's what Prabhupada said, using it, you know, jokingly kind of thing. But that's basically what Krishna said. You've missed the whole point, Arjuna. You've forgotten what the purpose of life is. You think it's a material adjustment or something? It's not. The so-called material situations who are, to are, are there to help us adjust the way we see the world, not the world. You want to adjust the world? You think you're some great person? That's not our business. Our business is to act in such a way that will help transform the way we see the world, not the world itself. That's being conducted by Krishna. This is the art. So acting according to what we've been given by Krishna. Of course, that means we have to act in such a way. In the case of Arjuna, he was clearly a Kshatriya, as mentioned in the verse here. And what happens if you don't perform your duty? So the next thing after, in the second chapter, after describing the basic principle of human life, which is meant to understand that we're not this body, that we're eternal spirit souls, and that we're eternal servants of Krishna. Even that wasn't explained. Krishna there in the second chapter just explained you're not the body, you're a soul, you're eternal. So he didn't really explain, you can say, back to yoga in that section, he came on to it later. There he's just explaining jnana. Most people don't have basic knowledge. They have only uh, agyan, they only have avidya, ignorance, knowledge of the externals. Most people have no knowledge of their internal existence. They're so absorbed on the external platform. So the first thing was to give this in this jnan, this spiritual knowledge, basic knowledge, A, B, C of spiritual life. But you don't, you know, you can't make much with an A, B, C. You have to go further than A, B, C. So then he explained a little bit more how you're going to understand this knowledge. How this is, theoretically, you may accept it. We devotees, I presume, everyone in this room, I don't know, but I presume everyone in this room accepts we're not the body. Is that right? Yes. We accept that, at least theoretically, right? Theoretically. Literally, practically realize we may not. Uh, we may not act on that platform sometimes, right? As soon as somebody does something to our mind and body or in a way which, so to speak, isn't pleasing to our condition, we may react in a very unfavorable way, isn't it? We, be, we may become disturbed. Have you ever had that experience? No? You've never become disturbed when somebody is like, you know, criticized us or, you know, put us in physical difficulty or, or denied us something or whatever. Have you ever had that experience? Never become angry, never become, you know, distressed, depressed, disturbed. Maybe you have, maybe you're too shy to say, too humble. But anyway, it's a common factor. So uh, it's usually symptomatic of the fact that we're still somewhat identifying with the body and mind as being me. Although theoretically we say one thing, but we may not always act on that platform. And I won't get into so many lucid examples, but the principle is quite often there, that we fall into physical or mental sense gratification. We still think, you know, my, I'm this body, mind, I want to enjoy it, and so on and so forth. Or we think it's mine, that's not really any better. Aham, uh mamati, -huh, me and mine. It's not ours, it belongs to Krishna. This is another great, let's say, ignorance of society today. They have no idea of who the real proprietor is. We think this is my body, I can do what I like with it. It's my mind. Another ignorance. So in order to try to help to release us of that, even if you have the theoretical knowledge, it's not enough. It's described, you know, for instance, even in devotional service, it's interesting if you may not have read it, but Bhaktivinoda you know, Thakur describes this at quite length in Jaiva Dharma, for instance. He describes how, you know, for different devotees at different stages, there are different, uh, let's say, uh, primary activities. Primary, and they're called mukya activities, and gona activities, which means secondary activities. So in the beginning of spiritual life, surprising enough, uh, the primary activity is not necessarily, um, let's say, shravanam kirtanam. 
It is there. But the primary activity is practical service, particularly daily worship, which means all kinds of practical service related to it, cleaning, different services around the temple and so on. Active service. Active service. Because we're not, when we chant it here, we're, our minds are not necessarily so clean. We're thinking of other things. We're doing other things. In the Nectar of Devotion, Srila Prabhupada describes that for those who are not actually serious about the change of heart, which probably is most of us, although we may say we're serious, we're not that serious, we're making some effort. But he said there clearly that therefore in the beginning it is in most important that one renders menial practical service and then gradually in course of time as one becomes purified by following that prescribed duty in this case it may be spiritual prescribed duty coming from the spiritual master or the temple authority but that gradually purifies our consciousness and our attraction our attraction for hearing and chanting starts to actually evolve, develop. Of course, we engage in hearing and chanting at every stage. They go on simultaneously. But we cannot jump over. We, as Krishna says later on in the 8th chapter, you do your duty and you think of me as well. So in our case, we do our duty, it's our service, and we chant Hare Krishna at the same time, even if we're not chanting purely. Even if not, that may not, most likely we're not, in one, in one sense you could say if we're following the regulated principles, not with pure conscience, not that we're focused on the holy name, try as we may. May not be there. One time in Nairobi, Prabhupada was discussing one devotee said, Srila Prabhupada, what about the quality in chanting? How to chant with quality? Prabhupada said, you chant with quality when you come to the quality. It's not rubber stamp. You render service, you carry on with your you know, prescribed duties, you'll come to that platform. Because by serving those devotees who are free to all vice, great service is done. Krishna is pleased. Krishna cleanses the heart. It's not the mechanics which cleanse the heart. We do the mechanics, prescribe duties. That's our duty. Because it belongs to Krishna. This is how Krishna is giving in Shastra, Guru and Sadhu how to utilize his body, mind, etc. in the most favorable way in order that it's pleasing to Krishna or gradually helping us to see it in relationship with Krishna. So it's very important. The devotee doesn't try to jump over. Sometimes devotees, they try to jump over. I was just mentioning one devotee just now, one 20 year old boy from Malaysia, one of our, son of one of our devotees, very nice young man, very active in our youth there. Came here to Vrindavan with one of his friends, took him to Radhakun, got initiated by some Babaji out there. 20 year old guy, not even following the regulated principles. This kind of nonsense is going on. Doesn't do any good. Absolutely no good. One has to act according to one's adhikar not according to someone else's motivated intentions. We have to act according to our adhikar, under the direction of someone who can see the truth. That's how it works, not according to our whim or someone else's desires or whims, according to Krishna's desire. This is Krishna's body, Krishna's mind, everything. How to utilize at this point to gradually become mature, so we can start to act maturely instead of acting according to our condition only. Well, that's the purpose of these instructions, so that people are properly situated in the Varna Ashram society. We don't have it nowadays in its original structured state exactly. We can't expect it to be so expertly, or well, let's say so perfectly presented, but it's still got, it still has its relevance to be situated in an issue. Panisha, we mentioned the other day, warns us, Prabhupada writes, to play the part designated to us by the Supreme Lord and not imitate. We all have certain characteristics and of course sometimes it may not be possible emergency situation, unavoidable circumstances, etc. How people are conditioned in different ways is sometimes difficult to ascertain like that. But as it is, still it has its relevance, not to imitate. 
we were just discussing just now how, how uh, the devotee, Prabhupada wanted for instance to start in our society in Krishna consciousness, it was just like shotgun preaching, everybody just chant Hare Krishna, but internally Prabhupada internally means from the, let's say, the structural point of view. He wanted to create a society with Brahmana, a Brahminical head, to give some light and guidance to the society in general. So he wanted the words to become Brahminical. Now it's not that everyone's going to show those characteristics or even be inclined, even if they've got a sacred thread, even if they're waving fans and, and incense at the deity, doesn't mean that one is necessarily Brahminical. It may be a, a service we have to do, etc., etc. But he wanted us to develop also the qualities of a Brahmin. Of course, the pure devotee has those qualities automatically. Now, it's not that everyone has to be like that either, but those who are in that position, at least, to show, to represent, in this form of preaching, people expect you to be non-pretentious. They expect you to be honest and straightforward. And if you're rightly situated as much as possible, the tendency will be that you will feel much more comfortable. Envy, anger, etc., pride will be there, but they will not be so disturbing. Naturally, a conditioned soul is still inflicted with various, these various diseases, but not so much. The more we're honestly situated, in this case it's occupational activity. Do your duty, work, you have to maintain yourself. We, in the class the other day, that was the subject matter. Um, persons who were specifically in the Brahminical role taking salaries. Now it's an unfortunate situation we're in today in our Krishna consciousness society. We're so small and society cannot, is not supporting for obvious reasons right now. So it's, it's a different circumstance. But the principle should be to work towards that so the Brahmins can actually perform their selfless duty with a clear mind, without any compromise, to guide the rest of the society to understand how to do their work in relationship with Krishna, for the pleasure of Krishna. They don't preach to other people, you should become a Brahmin. They preach that you should do your work for Krishna. You should fight for Krishna. You should give up the fruits of your work for Krishna. You should work for Krishna. They preach like that. They don't preach you should go nonsense, you're not following the regulated principles, you're useless, you should, and so on and so forth. They see where the person's at and they help them to actually connect with Krishna. The principles we follow are basically Brahminical principles. No eating meat, this, that, the other. Others may follow too, but not necessarily Shatras. In fact, it'd be interesting if Arjuna and Bhima and Yudhisthira were to turn up at Iskon today, wouldn't it? Uh, can we take initiation? No. You're not qualified. What do you mean you're not qualified? You're not following the four regulated principles. But I'm a Kshatriya. Doesn't make no difference. Arjuna, illicit sex. You just hear gambling, bima, meat eating, all of you intoxication, <laughs> out of here, you're not allowed to stay, go and stay in a dharma shell outside somewhere, you can pay for staying. But I, haven't you read the Bhagavad Gita, I'm the one you just spoke about, I don't care, you're not qualified, isn't it? Weird. <laughs> a house for the whole world to be in, of course, ultimately everyone the Vaishnava, can't spare everyone's. The idea is not everyone's going to become a Brahmin, but the Brahmins are supposed to be there. Those who've got that responsibility may have to do it, whether they're qualified or not. But the principle is we should try to also come to that qualification. The idea, those who are Kshatriyas and so on and so forth, perform one's duty. In the absence of such a, a let's say, a viable structure, a viable situation, this Kali Yuga, this topsy turvy, we do our best. We should be conscious of it at least. We're representing Srila Prabhupada. And we should try to be, uh, you know, as honest and genuine. Same thing with Grihastha or the ashrams, let's say. Be honest. Act according to one's situation. Then one may start to please Krishna. And one may even be a little bit more peaceful within one's own heart. Otherwise, we, can, we may be in danger. We are in danger. Imitate. Sometimes we have to because of extraordinary situations, do different things. But in general, the idea is that we should act accord accordingly as much as we can to where a psychophysical conditioning, um, we take advice how to do that. Um, sometimes, we, you know, we, as I said, we have to follow a certain example. We have to do things which may not be so psychophysical, but that purifies us if it's from the right authoritative source. And we gradually, gradually make advancement in spiritual life. 
the whole idea is to please Krishna, to realize the body which we've got is Krishna's energy, not to be rejected, but to learn how to use that most favorably for pleasing Krishna. The mind, same thing, it's not us, it's not mine, it's Krishna's energy, and it's learning how or understanding how to utilize that to the best capacity. And people have more, let's say, at least for the time being, they may seem to have a, a bigger capacity physically, mentally, intellectually, and so on. It doesn't matter. It's not the quali quantity to count that counts, but the fact that we're connecting that with Krishna, that's all. So everyone's on the equal level there, although they have not, we're not on the equal level physically and mentally in terms of the material perspective, but spiritually, yes, because everything is the energy of Krishna and the perfection. I was looking at a picture yesterday, a beautiful picture, actually. I don't know where I was looking at it. It was a picture of Lord Ramchandra, and he was holding that little squirrel in his hand. Remember, remember the story when they were building the bridge to Lanka? How Hanuman was throwing mountains into the ocean, and the squirrel was pushing grains of sand and straw and stuff into the ocean. Hanuman told him to get out of the way, you're getting in the way here, you're not doing any use anyway. And Lord Ram interjected and said, actually his service is better than yours, because it's without the ego, false ego. So, you know, it's very nice. I mean, it's not the quantity in that sense. It's according to our situation. We offer whatever we can, of course. In the beginning, it may only be 1%. But even if one is just simply, let's say, a very simple person, just likes to work, labor, work, perfect. Just do that for Krishna. Just learn how to do that for Krishna. And that's perfection. That's Prabhupada described it in 1968 in Montreal in a conversation, walking, morning walk. Prajuna Prabhupada asked Prabhupada, what is expertise? And Prabhupada said, mean, it means to find out what your, what your nature is and act accordingly, not imitate. So just like a florist, he just knows how to make flowers. You don't need to go to school to learn how to make flower garlands. The last thing you'll learn at school. Or learn how to garden, or learn how to do business. You don't go to school to learn those. This modern education, unfortunately, is destroying the finer, let's say, sentiments of the living entity. They don't know what to do. We've all become, you know, befool, we've become buffoons by the modern education system. Oh, I've been in trouble for that one. <laughs> but that's what's going on. People think they have to become an IT engineer, a computer whiz kid, this, that, the other. You can't get a job otherwise. So what do you want you to do? Then you don't have any brains to think independently. That's the idea. But actually is to bring out that, education is to bring out the, the best in a person what they'll be happy at doing, whether it's banging nails in wood or whatever it may be, or being a garbage cleaner. Imagine if you say, say to your mum, what do you want to be? I want to be a garbage. You call it garbage or litter or rubbish? I don't know what you call it here. What do you call it? Garbage, marriage? What do you call the rubbish? Litter, garbage? What do you call it? Huh? Waste. waste? I want to be a waste man when I grow up. I want to, someone who clears away all the rubbish, all the waste, all the garbage. What? Can they get something? Go to university, get a degree, you've got to become a doctor, an engineer, or an IT specialist, or whatever the latest thing is. Work hard, study hard, day and night, day and night. Homework, homework, more homework. They make me work so hard nowadays. They talk about child labor. I was watching the kid yesterday outside in the ghost shell, you know, sweeping the floor. Maybe, I don't know how old this girl, maybe eight, nine, ten year old little girl. Sweeping the garbage, it's not the garbage, sweeping the, the ghost shell, the floor and everything, mostly cow dung. Sweeping it up, you know. She was laughing and smiling, very happy, sweeping away there. Child labor, cruelty to children, right? Western society, isn't it? Be arrested. Hey, you can't do that, this is child labor. Well, I'll tell you, it's not even a millionth of a percent of the child labor of sending your kid to a school and whipping them to study all this rubbish. Isn't it? Isn't it? Torturing them. Isn't it? Literally. And then most of them, and some of them like it, that's okay. But most of them don't like it. They just don't like it. They just aren't into it. It's totally incompatible to their consciousness. And they say, that's, that's service to the child. Educate the child. What is that? What is it? You educate the child so the child can become happy, God conscious, and never take birth again. That's what education's for, isn't it? 
so they can be happy doing what they're doing. Whether it's digging in the ground, with, you can't, unfortunately we're in a society now where it just doesn't work. It could work, but it doesn't. You're forced. But this is the principle. Unfortunately, it's not so much. It's there a little bit sometimes, but not so much. Helping the person to really find out what they can do. You see the kids in Louis Bazaar, they're in, this, in the shop. You know, I never go shopping. I make sure that eight-year-old kid is not in the shop. Right? You wait for the grandfather or the elder to come, then you do your shopping. You've got a hundred percent better chance of getting a good deal from the old one. To the young one won't give you a, a penny off, not one rupee. Straight down the line. Doesn't miss an inch. Right? Isn't it? They're so sharp. They're like on the ball, you know. They're out to get their, their green, you know, their green badge or whatever it is. They're out to make the grade. <laughs> They're cool. Yeah, but anyway, we're, we're all in the same boat, so we're not, not to say, you know, but it's just unfortunate what to do. But this is what Krishna is saying here, you perform your duty, and today, what is it? We try, whatever it is we're doing, at least try to be Krishna conscious. At least try to remember Krishna, and try to put Krishna in the center, and realize that Krishna is the center of everything. Whether we're in an office, a factory, on the car, in the field, in an airplane, wherever it is, try to see it in relationship with Krishna. Try to see this as a sacrifice for the pleasure of the Lord, even if you're in college or school, or whatever it is. Try to see how all this knowledge, even though it may be seemingly irrelevant in one sense, is nonetheless has a relationship with Krishna. How to connect it with Krishna. And as Krishna is saying to Arjuna in this chapter, Arjuna, even if you are transcendental, you have to act in such a way to show others by example, to show others how to connect themselves with Krishna. So that's the art. Living in this society today is not easy, but to show others how they can live in this society. Of course, if we can show an alternative, that's the best. But others, that may be side by side. But still, living in this society, show people. And otherwise, what's, what can we show if we're just the same as everybody else? We have to show them how they can even do what they're doing in Krishna consciousness. So they're expecting to see that amongst their those. So the Grihastas, those who are working in society, have a very important job, a responsibility to preach this Krishna consciousness in such a way that people's perception of the world can change. So it's no longer seen as, you know, relative only, likes and dislikes, but rather seeing everything in relationship with Krishna. And show how they can do that. If you're a scientist, how to do that for Krishna. If you're a laborer, how to do that for Krishna. If you're a doctor, how to do that for Krishna. If you're a student, how to study for Krishna. Everything for Krishna, even though in itself it is completely, you can say, separated in one sense by consciousness. So we have to connect through the consciousness with Krishna. And if we are working in a society where this is the state, then we can gradually advance otherwise not, then we have to, you can say, take the association of those and learn how to do it in our lives so that we can be even more and more Krishna conscious in every situation, even if we're on the battlefield, we're driving a truck, we're in a, driving an aero, flying an aeroplane, we're doing a, 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 we're a neurosurgeon, whatever we're doing we're in life, how we can actually connect that with Krishna. Hare Krishna. Okay, we're finished there. Comments, questions? Yes, Matthew. Can you give more light to that point? More light? We want more lights on it. We should not change the world, but change our perception. Because I think we should... Yeah. Change, don't need to change the world, yeah. Well, we can show an example. You know, and there are some devotees who are sincerely trying. and it, and there's, you know, and I think everyone's trying, but you know, some are trying in different ways. But uh, you know, some are trying to do it literally, practically speaking, by trying to create, you know, various farm projects or various. It's a little easier in India maybe than the West, um, or in Indonesia and countries like this, where an alternative kind of environment to live in, which is hopefully more favourable for Krishna consciousness, and for bringing out the natural inspiration or initiative of the of the young people in society, help them to bring out their initiative in society. So as far as not changing the world, that, the point of that is that that's given to us by Krishna. 
those initiatives, those uh, uh, say abilities, tenancies, they're, they're Krishna's energies. We're just witnessing the interaction of those energies with the objects around us um, naturally being affected by others who are also in this kind of in the same world that we're in and by the effects of time we're just witnessing this various kind of say scene going on in front of us and uh, you can say because of the false ego being affected by it all but it's not really within our power Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Maharaj um, mentions interesting statement that one who thinks himself a reformer of this world is in need of reform no one can change the course of this world but by the breadth of one hair it's all perfectly arranged by the supreme lord we're just the witness and according to how we relate to the scene then we find ourselves in different scenery all the time good or bad karma whatever you call it and it says that those who appear to be let's say in um, effectively changing the world are mere instruments in the hands of providence the only change which is required in this world is a change of how we perceive it and that is evoked by exposing ourselves to the pure sound vibration of the holy name so society whatever else is going on in present society particularly with so many different things going on is especially geared towards trying to propagate the Yuga Dharma, the chanting of the Holy Name, no matter what else is going and I'll tell you a frank fact, I was working with, just before I joined the temple a few years, a couple of years ago I was working in a factory uh, two or three years ago, I can't remember how many years ago it was now I was working in a factory and I was cleaning, I, my job was to clean the floor and it was a pretty dirty factory so I had a lot of work to do but I was pretty ecstatic amongst other things I was pretty ecstatic because I was just chanting Hare Krishna the whole time I didn't worry, it didn't worry me I, I kind of wasn't even bothered about the factory, I wasn't even thinking about it I was, I was enthusiastic in those days I had an enthusiasm for chanting and I was just chanting all the time, I remember when I was sweeping the floor and clearing up all the garbage, putting it in the cans taking it outside, getting, picking up another can it was a metal factory producing metal products, a lot of metal filings, a lot of oil, metal and stuff like that. So, but it was really ecstatic, just chanting Hare Krishna at the same time. So other changes will automatically take place. If the consciousness changes, if the perception changes, naturally we will lose an interest in so many things which we may presently be depending upon. <laughs> What well, society is depending on, let's face it, you know, most of education is geared to making everyone a part of the consumer society, a productive part, uh, a supply agent, a, a, a demand agent, a consumer. You know, it's all part of it, isn't it? Buy, sell products. And look at most of the products in society. I mean, even you took the clock, put the clock back 50 years. Some of you may remember 50 years ago. Mo many of those things, like things like this, did they exist 50 years ago? No. Even this was very crude, if you had it all, very crude. Mobiles were unheard of, computers were unheard of, right? Everything was very crude. Even electricity was almost unseen in many places. Huh? What's that? Huh? When was it college? College. College. You went to you went to uni Oxford University. No, no, oh, okay. Salford. Actually. Salford. Yeah. Computer. It was the size of the room. Size. Yeah, the size. The computer. The first computers were half the size of this room. That was like high tech. <laughs> high tech. You know. Wow. And it would like ch come out chunk chunk chunk. You know, clunk clunk clunk. <laughs> Boom, boom. You had to like bash it with hammers. <laughs> it, was, it was like unbelievable. You know, television. I never saw television until I was twelve years old. I saw it in the shop, but I never had one. Never, never watched it. You know, what to speak of a car? Nobody in the whole street had a car. Nobody. Not even a motorbike. The whole street, hundred houses. We never had a bathroom. The house I lived in, no bathroom. No kitchen, 
We didn't have a kitchen, we didn't have a bathroom. Nothing. We used to take our bath in a bucket, cook on the, on the, on the, um, on the fireplace. That's how it was in England. Most people were like that. Working class people. Everybody, you know, it was, it was pretty simple like that. <laughs> everybody knew everybody. You could walk into anyone, no one's doors were ever locked. You could walk into anyone's door anytime you liked. They treated you just like their son. That's what it was like 60, 70 years ago in England. Now, you know, you can't, you don't even know who your neighbor is and better not. Huh? He blew himself up? Well, it's sort of these video games. He's never actually been, literally, it doesn't even go out the house. Yeah. And his friends are all online. Yeah. He doesn't go out and play in the street like we used to. He didn't yeah. go to the park. Everything's gone. Everything's, it's amazing people get married online now. <laughs> you don't even know they're marrying. <laughs> so many Facebook marriages and internet marriages and stuff. They don't even know they're marrying half the time. And maybe they're not marrying anyone. They <laughs> don't know. It's amazing, world's changed in that sense, but if the consciousness has changed, and things may, may or may not change externally, but you know, our interest in uh, unnecessary things will subside. You won't want all these things. It's not just a force, it's not forced, you can't force it. It's got to be a genuine change. And this is what's mentioned here, artificial renunciation. You try to artificially renounce it, it doesn't work. People are not ready. So we have to work with what they've got and work through it so they can, you know, actually become purified in consciousness. Not try to, you know, smash things, change things. In New Zealand, I mean, 1976, a couple of devotees, they got so angry, 76, something like that, they, they, were, they, were, they studied how to make bombs. And they were making bombs in their, in their garage. They weren't living in the temple, they were outside, they weren't even in Iskon, they were another group, but they were in Iskon and they left Iskon, joined another group. They started making bombs and they thought we're going to blow up the slaughterhouses because New Zealand, as you know, the main industry at them was slaughterhouse cows. So they were going to blow them up with bombs. That was their idea. Can you imagine? Such a mentality. But that was their idea. And, uh, and, and well, fortunately or unfortunately, they blew themselves up. They killed themselves. They blew up. The bomb went off in their garage and they killed themselves. Obviously not what Krishna wants. That's not the way we do it, blowing up the Twin Towers. That's not our approach. Our approach is a change of consciousness. Even though the educational system and every other system, you could say, is corrupted and directed towards you know, Kali Yuga's nefarious intentions. But nonetheless, we have to you know, use our intelligence to work through it and try to uh, purify, purify the consciousness so that gradually, gradually things will change, if necessary, externally. And not start, we have to start where it really counts, not we start where it begins with consciousness. And in a sense, in the Bhagavad Gita, we see Arjuna, Krishna started off with that point you're not the body, spiritual, spiritual consciousness. Then working on how to realize that goal, knowing what the goal is, and then how to achieve that goal. So that's the duty of the leaders, the Brahmins in society, to reach that goal. Even if it is, probably his own words, he called it, they you know slaughterhouse, education, modern education. Whatever it is, we have to try to purify um, or let's say spiritualize the activities that are going on in this world today and at the same time try to show an, an alternative, an example. So that people, otherwise people have no alternative. They won't be able to change. They're not so easy just to take up Krishna consciousness. Both things are important. Both are important. Anything else? Am I stuck in a time where... Relax, what's that? Am I stuck in a time where I have no clue of what my material nature is? I mean, like, like we just kind of mashed up with outside information that this is what they're supposed to do. If I went to school outside, it seems like it's put on me what, I, what I'm supposed to do. Isn't it? Pretty much, you know. It's, uh, sometimes you can ascertain it easy when a child is young. Um, sometimes it's easier. 
Varna Shankara in this age is, of course, commonplace, so it's a little more difficult anyway, but it's sometimes a little easier when you're younger. And it does get jumbled up by, naturally, by all the association, the education system, the association, the pressure sometimes of parent, parenthood, the necessity of what, what's available, jobs, peer pressure, so many different factors, watching the television, watching video games, this, the heroes, wanting to imitate this, that, the other, so many different things. Um, in whatever it may be, in, it's very difficult. But uh, I think you, you're very good at dancing and singing. It looks like it. I've seen you dance and sing very nicely, so I think that's probably a good occupation for you. <laughs> what else comes up? What else you can do? I don't know. Cleaning, cleaning. Huh? Cleaning. Cleaning, then clean. You know, I mean, what do you like? Back to even Otakor describes Chaitanya Sikshamrit. He said, you can ascertain what a person is when he's doing something, when he's really, when he's happy and, and naturally inspired to do it. When you're happy doing it. Now, if I ask you, what are you happy doing? What do you like doing? Ask yourself deep down, what do you actually, materially, what do you happily like to do? You have, and put, ask yourself deep down inside. Now, you may have a lot of things, no harm. You might do a lot of things, as Varna Shankar. But you can ask yourself, what do you like to do? What is it you actually like to do? Materially. Make money. Money. <laughs> you like to make money. That's, 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 well, you may have a little business streak in you. You may have a little business streak in you. You have to see. But, you know, some people really like to make money. I never did like to make money. Never had an interest. The funny thing is, I never like to make money. And I, I, money just always comes to me like anything. I never do anything to get money. I never like, I mean, I worked in the factory just to do something in the meantime for three months. And that was, you know, next to nothing. But otherwise, I never, never had interest in making money. But money comes anyway. It's different karmas we have. Some people, that's their, they like to make money as an occupation. So you make money and use it for Krishna. That's all. Use it for Krishna. What do you like to do? You ask the question. What do you like to do? Pardon? Singing and dancing. So sing and dance. <laughs> huh? And feasting. Well, you're in the right place. Sing, dance and feast as much as you can. And if you have to do some other things, fine. You know, you always find in any situation there's some, you have to do a few other things you may not like to do, but the primary thing should be, something should be there. What do you like to do? I don't know, what's your name? I don't know. Yes, what do you like to do? Well, I like to play sports. Sports? Play sport. You like to play sports? You still play sports, do you? I used to. You like to play sport. Well, there's sports in Krishna consciousness. I'm not saying you should go back to playing sport, though we heard something about sport in the Bhagavatam class this morning, something about football, I can't remember what it was, but Lardinand Maharaj was talking about football, but I don't know if that's meant we're supposed to watch it, I don't think so, but anyway. Prabhupada said swimming and wrestling are Vaishnav sports, I don't know if you like swimming or wrestling, but besides that, you know, there's one devotee, he's an interesting devotee, you should talk to him if you see him, Peter Burwash his name is, Peter Burwash used to play tennis for Canada, and he was also coach for the tennis uh, Olympic team. And uh, he had tennis schools all over the world, or he used to go to schools all over the world teaching tennis. And Prabhupada spent hours talking to him. He never took initiation for some reason. He chanted 16 rounds for I don't know how long. But uh, Prabhupada spent hours with him, telling, uh, explained to him how to do tennis for Krishna. He told him not to give it up, but to continue with his work and how to do it in Krishna consciousness. That was the essence of what he spoke to me about. So if, if some people are that way inclined, they may be, well, that's your occupation, sports teacher or sportsman or whatever it is. It doesn't mean you have to necessarily give, it will naturally be given up in due course of time. All these things are stepping stones to the actual goal, help, to help us on our path. You may have other things you like to do in life. What do you like to do? I'd like to ask a question. Okay, his, his job in life is asking questions. Someone's <laughs> got to do that. All right, ask a question. Like uh, many people and many devotees, they are like uh, wondering about what's their nature, what they should do in life. So, what's the role of astrology? In, uh, what's the role of astrology? Yeah. What's the role of it? Well, it was always taken into account in Vedic culture. Um, and even still is taken into account in many cultures, including in many places in India, many people take it seriously. In reality, it has an important role to play. In practice, the, the expertise or the uh, situation may or may not be so, uh, let's say, 
expert or so efficiently, um, say, clear. But in principle, yes, it has a very important role in, in Vedic society. People would, would study the astrology, Lord Chaitanya's astrology, Srila Prabhupada had his astrology when he was a child. It gives an indication of many things. So they would take that seriously into account, even in giving sannyas in many sampradayas. And even in our own line, if you want to take sannyas, you've got to go through Pallad Nandamaraj. He studies your astrology for you. You can't take astrology if you're coming soon into Venus or some situation like that. You won't get on the list. At least not for a while. <laughs> not a good timing. So, you know, it was taken into account for various reasons. Now, it may not be so accurately affected. I'm not, I'm not an astrologer. I know only a very little bit. I know astrologers. Um, I know it, I was with a devotee today who was an astrologer, in fact. But, um, you know, like many of these things in Kali Yuga, things become a little cloudy. Whatever all these sciences are there, they're giving in the Vedas, they're there to help people in their material lives and their progress towards the ultimate purpose of life, but they may not be so accurate. If Prabhupada himself did and didn't take seriously astrology, he accepted for gentlemen these things were important, but in one sense, for those who are on the spiritual path, he didn't. Otherwise, the tendency is we get too much carried away with these things, and we become overly dependent on these things, and almost monitor our lives based upon it. So, if it's actually being guided, if it's actually being, you know, say, compatibly guided on the spiritual path, it might be quite can be quite useful, but it may not be absolute either. So it is time, place, circumstance, a little bit. Kali Yuga situation, they're not always so perfect in their, you know, let's say, perception of the situation. And it's cloudy, just like we were just hearing just now how things are cloudy in this age, hard to ascertain your nature. And it is a very jumbled age. But in principle, yes, it, it has an important part to play in society. It's like Ayurveda or Vastu, all these sciences are there to help facilitate the objective goal of life. If it's useful for that, then it can be seen as useful. But sometimes we get too carried away, almost to the point we become dependent on that and lose the thread of depending on Krishna. So if you can use it, good. Certainly we're going through different stages of life and that should be ascertained from astrological perspective, you could say, and certain people have certain talents and qualities it should be ascertained through. But as we've heard in our society today, oftentimes there are many other factors working which make it pretty hard to necessarily perfectly you know, follow that line, even if it is correct. So we have to be a little bit let's say, um, a little bit kind of like, not flexible, but a little bit conscious of that. Can't expect it to be perfect. And those who are performing or doing that duty of astrologers or Ayurvedic doctors or whatever, they traditionally have to be very, very expert and very pure in consciousness to be able to do such a, a very important service in material society. Anything else? Are you an astrologer? Most devotees, I'm sure, have had something, some point in their lives, isn't it? You hear, what is my astrology? Yeah. <laughs> some senior devotees are doing it so they can provide the let's say the Krishna conscious or the Vaishnav um, service to devotees, especially those who want to get married, those who are you know, having children and so on and so forth. Usually they take help from astrology or at least they get some astrological um, information there, usually, to assist as an assistant in choosing one's partners and so on and so forth. It can be helpful, in principle at least. It's not the only factor, but it can be very helpful. Like a weather report, it's very helpful, if it's accurate. 
I'm not saying whether it's accurate or not, but in principle it's, it can be helpful. Hare Krishna. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai.